Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well and of course Arnie does too. And today's video I will be continuing my invasive fish series, but again today's episode's a little different as I will be going through three invasive fish species, but also be going through one invasive crustacean and one invasive mollusk. And we'll start off in the fresh waters of Europe and Asia as we have the tench. Now the tench is typically found in slow moving waters such as lakes and lowland rivers. And in these waters the tench is known for being a very greedy omnivore as they usually feed on small crustaceans, worms, plant matter and mollusks. And in fact they're so so good at eating mollusks that they're often introduced into ponds to control snail populations. But they also have a few other traits that make them a popular pond fish, as not only is there an orange colour variant, but they're also very adaptable, as they can often be found in stagnant muddy waters where there is very little dissolved oxygen. And when the weather gets a bit colder, they're known to almost completely shut down, and in some cases even bury themselves in mud until the warmer weather comes around. And surprisingly, in the wild they've even been found in brackish conditions, so they can almost master all freshwater ecosystems apart from fast flowing waters. And because of their hardiness, they are often noted to be the last surviving fish in a dried up lake or river. And in their native waters of Eurasia, they are known to reach a maximum size of around 70 centimetres or around 28 inches. And a fish of this size can really get through a large amount of food. So in an ecosystem where they don't belong, they can usually outcompete and outlive the native fish. And this is exactly what's happened in some parts of the US and Canada, as they were originally introduced in the late 19th century for use as both a food food fish and a sport fish, but these tench soon escaped and have now spread throughout many rivers in the US and Canada. And as they're very hardy and greedy, this has had a negative effect on the ecosystem, as they compete with many native fish, such as minnows, bullheads and suckers. And as they feed in the substrate, this can also create algal blooms and create cloudy water, meaning that some predators are unable to hunt efficiently. And today the tench has been documented in 38 states as well as British Columbia and parts of Quebec. And to stop this fish from spreading further, it is illegal to use them as bait and they cannot be sold as pond fish or aquarium fish. So hopefully this very slimy fish won't spread any further. But for our next species, we'll head over to the Northern Pacific as we have the Red King Crab. Now when most people think of crabs, they think of the small species that you can find at the beach. But when you venture into the deeper parts of the ocean, you can find these large spider-like monstrosities. And these crabs really are giants, as they can have a leg span of around 1.8 8 meters or 5.9 feet. And the reason why they're called king crabs is because the spikes on top of their carapace are said to resemble the spikes on a crown. And in their native range, king crabs are known to eat almost anything they can find, as they scavenge and hunt on the seabed, eating anything from smaller crabs, algae, small worms, clams, small fish and any other dead animal that reaches the seabed. But the king crab is also a highly valued delicacy and they can fetch a high price and are usually only served at high end restaurants. And because of this lucrative fishing opportunity, it's easy to see how other fishermen from other parts of the world would be very jealous of this cash crab. And this is exactly why they are now invasive in the marine waters around northern Europe as in some parts of the world they have the nickname of Stalin's crab. As in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin ordered thousands of baby crabs to be moved 3,000 miles by road all the way to the western end of the Soviet Union and this was so that they could be released into the ocean and there would be a constant supply of red king crab. Unfortunately the majority of these crabs died in transit and only a few live ones were released. There was a second attempt to move these crabs in the 1960s and this time it was done by air and a large amount of red crabs were released and although his original plan was a success after his death, the introduction is still causing problems today. Because as it eats almost anything in its path, it's made the seabeds around northern Europe into deserts, with no life being found apart from these large spider-like crabs. And in its native habitat, one of its main predators is the giant Pacific octopus, and this is not present in the European waters, and there are not many other predators like it. So their numbers have been able to explode, and today they are still spreading at an alarming rate, as they're thought to be advancing southwards along the coast of Norway at around 50 kilometers or 31 miles a year and as they have very few predators in European waters this could be a big problem in the coming years. But for our next species we'll be heading over to the fresh waters of North America as we have the brook trout. Now the brook trout is one of many fish that are called trouts but are actually chars and in the wild they prefer large lakes, rivers and streams and in these waters they are a predator mainly feeding on insects, worms, leeches, crustaceans and smaller fish and on this diet they can reach maximum size of around 86 centimeters or around 34 inches. 
And for some people, it might be strange to think of the brook trout as invasive, as over many parts of its natural range, its numbers are in decline. This is mainly due down to industrialization, pollution, and damming. And the introduction of the brown trout into America in the 1800s really didn't help their numbers either. But not only is this species invasive over other parts of the US, but it's also invasive over large parts of Europe. And as they seem to have a never-ending battle with the brown trout, it means that invasive brook trout are always competing with the native trout species for food. And in areas where it's become established, scientists have reported that it has negative effects on the growth rates of brown trout. So even though it's threatened in its native range, it is still causing problems elsewhere. But for our next species, we'll be heading down to South America as we have the apple snail. Now there are many different species of apple snail that can be found all over the world, but the ones I'll be focusing on in this video are the South American species. And unfortunately, the story of the apple snail becoming invasive is again all down to the aquarium trade, as aquatic snails are very popular additions to aquariums, as not only do they feed on the algae on the tank, but they also feed on the waste from fish. And when some unresponsible fish keepers don't want their snails anymore, they release them into the wild where they can cause big problems. As apple snails are voracious and opportunistic feeders, feeding on multiple types of aquatic vegetation as well as other snail species. And apple snails are also amphibious, meaning that they can move in and out of water systems and even travel from one body of water to the other. And this has meant that they can spread very quickly and completely take over some ecosystems. And this species is known to lay its eggs outside of the water, and this prevents them from being predated on by other aquatic predators. And this in turn means that the large majority of these snail eggs will hatch. And one of the worst affected areas today is the US. And as these snails can reach the size of a baseball, they can really get through a lot of food. And they're known to eat the majority of wetland plants in the US, meaning that they can completely destroy habitats for other animals. And even though there are many predators that will feed on the apple snails, they are simply reproducing too quickly for the predators to keep up. So this is another perfect example of why you should never release aquarium animals into the wild. But for our next species, we'll be heading over to the freshwaters of Europe and North America as we have the burbot. Now burbots are normally found in large cold bodies of water and they can often be found in rivers and lakes where the water is completely frozen over. And in these waters, the burbot is a predator, mainly feeding on other fish as well as crustaceans. And on this diet, they can reach maximum size of around 116 centimeters or 46 inches. But again, it might be surprising for some people to find out that this species is invasive as it has proven to be quite vulnerable in the past. As in the 1600s, burbots were so common in England that they were often fed to pigs. But in the present day, the burbot is thought to be extinct in the UK, with the last recorded capture being in 1969. And it's thought that the main reasons behind its extinction were extensive agriculture and metallic pollution after World War II. But although this fish has proven to be quite vulnerable, it is invasive over some parts of the US, as today it's invasive in the Green River Basin, in both Wyoming and Utah. And as they are a predatory species, they're having adverse effects on the native sport fish, and they have proven to have a negative effect on the smallmouth bass and flannelmouth suckers. And in an attempt to control their numbers, there is now no limit to how many burbots you can keep within the Green River Basin. But as this species prefers very cold water, its invasion is limited, and hopefully their numbers can be kept under control in the coming years. But that's about it for this video. If you know of any more invasive species, then let me know down in the comments below, and I'm sure I'll make another part to this series. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these, but until next time, goodbye. <laughs>